Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, University of Canterbury. It's great to see you here tonight on a very cool, wet uh, Christchurch evening. My name is Bruce Manley. I'm head of the School of Forestry here, of the, here at the University of Canterbury, and I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the presentation tonight. So welcome to the University of Canterbury's new What If Wednesdays lecture series. Every Wednesday between now and December, there will be a free lecture at this time here in the Undercroft. The lectures are free, but you do need to register online for each one. We hope you enjoy this evening's lecture and return to attend others. Now this is uh, Christchurch in the year 2012, so we need to do a little housekeeping item in terms of emergency procedures. So in, in the event of an emergency, the exit doors for the Undercroft at either end of the space, I think pretty obvious to you, emergency exit through there, or up the stairs up, up here, or through, many of you would have come in through that back door there. So I think the emergency exits are, are pretty obvious. The assembly point, once you exit the building, is the Clyde Road uh, car park to the east of the building, so down Arts Road towards uh, Clyde Road. So that's the, uh, the assembly, point, assembly point in case of uh, emergency. Well, tonight's uh, topic is uh, what if New Zealand was uh, fully greenhouse gas neutral? Tonight's uh, speaker is Associate Professor Ewan Mason. Ewan was born in Invercargill, but grew up in Switzerland and the United States. He took his first degree in forestry from the University of Maine in 1975, earned a PhD from the University of Canterbury in 1992, and is an Associate Professor in Forestry at the University of Canterbury. He's taught here and studied here since 1993. His research focuses on eco-physiological modelling of forest growth and yield, silviculture and impacts on the environment and silviculture on wood properties. He has published more than 90 peer-reviewed scientific papers and has contributed to five books as either an editor or an author. He is one of the five editors of the international scientific journal Forestry published by Oxford Journals. In 1999, Ewan was awarded the John Eady Memorial Fellowship by the Scottish Forestry Trust. In 2006, he was selected as New Zealand's Senior Fulbright Scholar. And he is a fellow of the New Zealand Institute of Forestry. Ewan's been involved with climate change issues for many years, beginning in 1974, with some considerations of impacts of atmospheric CO2 increases on crop production and more recently he was contracted to firstly the National Party to provide advice on forestry and climate change and then to the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, now the Ministry of Primary Industries, to speak to local communities about forestry and the emissions trading scheme. His models provide estimates of climate change impacts on forest productivity and he has been a frequent commentator on our ETS. He enjoys a great passion for science, particularly biology. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ewan Mason. Thanks so much, Bruce. Yeah, well, I don't take uh, any credit for the, the policies that have come through recently on climate change. <laughs> and I have given advice frequently, as, you, as you, those of you who know me will know that I've, I'm not uh, very shy when it comes to giving advice. Um, so what if New Zealand was greenhouse gas neutral? Well, Firstly, let's, I'm gonna, this, is the, this is what we're going to cover. We're going to cover a bit of an overview of climate change and then ask the question, should we act? And I'm going to be, this is going to be an audience participation, so prepare yourselves. And we're not going to, yeah, you'll see, let's see what it, I got you worried, I can tell. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about mitigation methods, we'll talk about New Zealand's situation uh, and a greenhouse gas neutral New Zealand. We'll talk about change in the way we live and the role of forests, and then we'll discuss a few issues that really are impediments to us getting there. So firstly, if you've been around for the, and reading for the last few years, you will have seen these sorts of graphs. These came from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the top one shows uh, variations in the Earth's temperature, surface temperature, um, since 1860. The bottom one shows some projections further back in time, um, not based on, of course, on uh, just 
people holding thermometers, but on ice cores and things like that. Um, so what I'd like to ask you is how many people believe that this is happening and believe that this is anthropogenic, at least partly anthropogenic? Put up your hands if you believe that it's happening. What is anthropogenic? Oh, sorry. Anthropogenic means it's at least partly caused by humans. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> and uh, how many people believe that it's not happening? Okay, how many people believe that it's happening, but it's not caused by people? Okay, a couple. That's fair enough. Everybody needs to make up their own mind. And we hear a lot of discussion about this. Um, and I personally believe it's happening, but I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a scientist who deals much with, with uh, global climate models. I've um, never seen one, in fact. I've seen the output of global climate models. I don't pretend to have any great expertise in that area. But I have heard arguments, and I uh, might just touch on a couple of the arguments. One of the arguments we hear sometimes is um, climate's always changed, even before people were here. So, of course, we're, it's, it's not due to us. Have you heard that argument? Well, let's examine the rationale, okay? The rationale is akin to this. If I were to slap you around the ears, it wouldn't hurt you because if I stamp on your foot, it will hurt you. It's the same line of argument. Just because the climate has changed in the past through other influences does not mean that human beings cannot change the climate. Right? So there's some false reasoning in there. And in fact, this is the sort of thing we're seeing at the moment. We're seeing that uh, this is from NASA, uh, the North Pole. We're seeing less ice as the years go by. Uh, this is past climate uh, projected from ice cores. It's just one, story, one of the stories. There are several estimates that differ somewhat of past climates. Um, and you might think, well, yeah, there's been a lot of change in the past. And, and why is that? Well, you've probably, some of you will have heard of Mr. Milankovic. Have you heard of Mr. Milankovic? Probably Professor Milankovic. Okay. You've heard of Milankovic cycles? Who's heard of Milankovic cycles? A few of you? Okay. Can you all see that? It's not very clear, is it? I'm sorry about that. This is one I poached from the web, it's, um, and I should have uh, found a better version of it. What it's showing is the top line is variation in uh, mid-July mean insulation at, uh, of 65 degrees north latitude, where there's a lot of land mass. And the bottom two lines are from ice cores. They're estimates of global temperature. And there's a fairly good correlation. Now, what we're looking at the top, the top there is the result of what are called Milankovic cycles. These are cycles in the angle of the Earth's tilt and also in the eccentricity and the location of the tilt with respect to the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit around the sun. That varies. It wobbles in a couple of different ways. And it produces these cycles, and these cycles cause the onset of ice ages and interglacials. So yes, climate has changed in the past. And if you ask what should be happening now, based on Milankovic cycles, you don't get this increase in temperature that we appear to be seeing. Another thing we hear is uh, sunspots. And this one's a, I'm, a, I'm an amateur astronomer, and I'm interested in sunspots. So sunspots come in cycles. They vary somewhat in length. They vary in, in amplitude. Uh, and uh, this is this, the record that we have. So you can see Galileo's first uh, First observations right here. That's Galileo. From about 1645 through to 1700, there were very, very few sunspots. And scientists got excited and wrote to one another when they actually saw one. And that ended about 1700. Now, that coincided with about a, a 0.3 to a 0.4 degree drop in global temperature. Then we had a period of fairly healthy sunspot cycles. And you know, most people know what sunspots are. The little cooler spots in the sun is called by the magnetic field of the sun getting all twisted up as it rotates. Some parts of the sun rotate different, different uh, speeds than others. And uh, then it snaps back, and you get straight magnetic lines again. And you get periods of very low sunspots. So we had a period. That period there is well known. And this one here is well known. So this is the Maunder minimum. This is the Dalton minimum. In the Dalton minimum, uh, we had a slight reduction in global temperatures. So there's a coincidence. Now, 
we don't know the cause. And astrophysicists don't know the cause. Global climate scientists don't know the cause. We don't know for sure that there's, it might, there might have been just a coincidence. But there is an argument that maybe sunspots are, have been an influence on global climate. And what you're seeing down there in blue is uh, my personal projection for the next cycle based on a statistical analysis of those previous cycles. And it, I would guess it's going to be somewhere in that range. Uh, the amplitude will be probably plus or minus about 15% uh, of what I've shown there based on a 95% a confidence limit. And uh, that may actually have political implications. Because if there is something that we don't understand that relates activity on the sun to global climate, and we get a slight reduction, imagine the politics okay, over the next couple of cycles. And imagine if the climatologists are right, and I personally believe they probably are right, imagine what that's going to do, what's going to happen when the sunspots return. So there's been a lot of discussion about that, and uh, I was expecting more of you would have been uh, concerned that maybe uh, we're wrong about this and we shouldn't, shouldn't act. This is a, a famous graph. This came from Fritz Christensen and Lassen in 1991. It was an article in a prestigious journal, Science, and it purported to show that the length of the sunspot cycles was related to uh, global temperature. And uh, it was a very convincing graph. People got really excited until uh, a paper by Lout who re-examined the data and extended it backwards in time and found that you really had to make a transformation in amplitude in order to make the change in sunspot cycle length fit the pattern. So he was unable to replicate that result. Another one that I thought somebody might bring up is uh, Svensmark, 1998. Now his explanation for some connection between sunspot cycles and what's happening on Earth is that sunspot cycles coincide with the ch changes in influxes of cosmic rays. And he was saying there's a correlation between cosmic ray influx and cloudiness, and cloudiness influences climate. And Loud had to go at him as well, and uh, pointed out that he actually changed data sources halfway through in order to make his nice graph up the top here. And if you actually stick with the same data source in either case, it doesn't work. You don't get the same correlation. So this is from the IPC, IPCC, the International Intergovern Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. On the right-hand side in the green there, you see a range of projections. So there's uncertainty. And in science, there's always uncertainty. It's even possible that the climatologists are wrong. Another argument we hear is that it's all a hoax. Have you heard that one? It's all a hoax, and the climatologists are just doing it to get research money. Have you heard that one? Yeah. I mean, I'm a scientist, and there's no way in the world that I would knowingly lie to get money for research. I mean, my integrity is my greatest asset. Now, I cannot believe that hundreds of scientists around the world have got together and decided, come on, guys, we're going to lie to the public and get some money. I mean, this is not reasonable. So the one thing you can be sure of is that climate scientists genuinely believe that we have a problem. And they're being open about the uncertainty about that problem. But it is a problem, and it has consequences. And they're suggesting that we should do something about it. They're not only suggesting the temperature is going to rise, but, so that's the top graph there, you get a shifted average. They're expecting there'll be increased variability. So you have more times with extreme hot, and more times with extreme cold in various parts of the world. And that there may be change symmetry also. So you get a, a shift, that's become the, the, the distribution of, of uh, temperatures becomes more skewed. And uh, I'm not sure how visible this is to you. This is a little plot, and New Zealand is down. Actually, I wanted to show this because New Zealand is on here. This is showing <laughs> behind that little chart. That's our chart. And what it's showing is that uh, they're making projections of the likely change in extremes of temperatures. These are 20-year return daily extremes. Uh, so the, the, the peak daily extreme in any given year, the 20-year return of the maximum, is expected to go up in New Zealand. It depends on which scenario within that range you choose, and they've chosen three of them and chosen a, a, across the range. Um, by 2045 to 
65, which is 2046 to 65, about one to, to, to one and a half degrees, and 2081 to uh, 2100, uh, maybe as much as four degrees, anywhere from about two to four degrees. But that's just one example of the sort of projection that these scientists are making about the extremes. And they're saying, and other people are saying, that there will be impacts. There are impacts on health, with weather-related mortality, with infectious diseases, with air quality, agricultural impacts on crop yields and irrigation demands, forest impacts, changing forest composi composition. The geographic range of forests could change and species could change very rapidly. Maybe we'll see extinctions, it's suggested. Uh, water resource impacts, impacts on water supply, water quality, competition for water, impacts on coastal areas with uh, erosion of beaches, sea level rise, and loss of habitat and species. And most of these don't sound too grand. There are cases, and some of my models show that given our projections, given the projections from our local um, climate people, we'll get a modest increase in productivity of Kangaroa Forest if they're right. So that's kind of nice, but at a lot of expense in other respects. So this is what they're saying is the culprit. This is the atmospheric CO2 concentration measured at Mauna Loa um, from that last little bit is measured at Mauna Loa. The rest of it is taken from ice cores um, since the year 1000. And when you look closely, you see some little squiggles in the record from, from year to year. Each year has a, a squiggle like that. We're going to touch on that a bit later. So that's what they're saying. In my lifetime, I've seen a significant rise in the concentration of CO2. If we look at the nature of that CO2, we see it contains more and more C12 at the expense of C13. Now that's significant. It tells us that the source of the CO2 was originally organic because in photosynthesis, plants will preferentially take up C12 at the expense of C13, unless it's really dry when you get a lot of C13. Um, and when you release that back into the atmosphere, you increase the concentration of C12 relative to C13. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So the source is organic. And uh, this is the very likely culprit. This is the uh, introduction of organic fossil fuels, um, mostly into the atmosphere. There's also some gases from cement production um, in here. So this is part of the story of what we're doing to our atmosphere. This is metric tons of carbon per year and billions put into atmosphere by us. So the IPCC is saying, we're going to have some hard times. And they've, more recently, they've moved from making predictions about climate to trying to make, to, to model thinking around how to deal with disasters that they see coming. So they're saying there'll be an intersection of extreme weather and climate events, of people who are in vulnerable places, who are exposed, who suffer. There'll be disaster. There'll be some disaster risk management. That should lead people to adapt to climate change and to change the way they live, which should have an impact on anthropogenic climate change. So the question is, should we respond? And if so, how should we respond? And um, another good question is, are scientific standards of proof required? And I think this is a subtle question, but it's really, really important because there are a number of scientists around the world who are saying, no, this, is, this story is incorrect. It's not happening. So if you're not a climatologist, how do you weigh up the evidence? If you're a politician and you have to make a decision, how should you decide? How do you, weigh, how do you cope with that situation? And that situation is really very real. I was interested when the Stern report came out uh, that Stern, the Stern was an economist. And what he said was, it will cost us more than an order of magnitude more if we don't respond than if we choose to spend some money now and respond to climate change. And Tony Blair's response to that was, now we can be sure that climate change is real, which was kind of bizarre, because I didn't think Stern was saying anything about whether it was real or not. But clearly, Tony Blair was thinking, how do I respond? How should I personally respond as a leader to this situation? <clears throat> 
So our scientific standards of proof required, and what, what I've got there is something that's typically used in science. When we do an experiment, we want to know in a variable world, and biology is a really complicated science, much more complicated than physics, because plants are so incredibly complicated. Living, living things are incredibly complicated. I should, I'm, I'm biased. Okay, I'm a forester. Yeah. And I have, a, I have some, some interests. You know, I love life. But anyway, um, so when, we do, when, we ha when we're dealing with a complicated system and we do experiments within that complicated system, and we want to find out perhaps whether there's a relationship between uh, maybe what we do and the response of the plants, the way we treat them and their response, there's going to be a lot of variability between in the measurements. And so we use statistics to determine if we see a pattern, and we think that pattern is related, there is a relation between what we do and how the plants respond, then what is the chance that we're mistaken in, in assuming that there's a real connection? And we call that a type, the probability of a type one error. We denote it as alpha. So that's a, a standard in science is to say, well, if, it's a, if there's a one in 20 chance, you start to begin to believe that maybe you're not kidding yourself, okay? And uh, so should we apply this to climate change and to our response to climate change is the question. And for this, I'm going to turn to one of my hobbies. This, look at some early astro imaging. So, well, that's actually not quite the astro imaging I had in mind. <laughs> this is early astro imaging, but it's more for, for aesthetics than for, for science. Let's go a bit forward in time and go to this guy, who was the first person. He's E. Barnard. He was a, the first person to image the cosmos with, with, photog with photographs in any great abundance. There were one or two people taking pictures of the moon before him, but he was the first guy to really start to do science with, with images in, in photography. Now suppose, just suppose, that somebody in his archive, perhaps his wife put some stuff aside, found three of his plates that hadn't been seen before. And when astronomers started to examine these plates, they discovered that they could see an asteroid on each of the plates. And it was moving, because the plates were pictures of the, more or less the same part of the sky. And they could see this thing moving. And from, its, from those three plates, they could calculate an orbit. And it was a very, very elliptical orbit, very much elongated around the sun. And not only that, they could tell from its orbit and its expected reflectance that it was a reasonably good size asteroid. And when they calculated the orbit, they started to get really worried because they realized that in about 40 years, this thing was likely to hit the Earth. And they were pretty sure it was going to hit the Earth. And it was a really, really large asteroid. It was like a planet killer, right? So we're talking about this sort of thing, right? Sort of thing bigger than the thing that killed off the dinosaurs, right? So we're in jeopardy. And, um, on the other hand, there's 6% of the world's astronomers who've also got a hold of these plates. And they said, we've done our calculation. Well, we don't think that's going to happen. And the question is, how, would, how should you respond to that situation? You've got a team of experts, hundreds of experts across the world, and the vast majority are saying to you, disaster is going to happen. You need to spend money. And there is a known way, by the way, of avoiding this. If you get in early enough, and I should have mentioned, this asteroid is now too far out for our best telescopes to actually see it. So we can't actually do anything but work with these three plates. Right? So how should we cope with that decision making? Should we say, oh, it's, uh, it doesn't meet the scientific criteria, and we're not just going to see, we're not going to do anything. Is that a correct response? Now, how would we, what could we do? Well, we could spend probably many hundreds of billions of dollars it would be, but it would be sending up a reasonably good sized spacecraft to fly along next to the asteroid. It's called a, a space tractor. Not actually touching it. Just the presence of that spacecraft will divert the asteroid enough that it would miss the Earth. It's a well-known process. We could, actually, there are robotic telescopes right now searching the sky, looking for asteroids that will collide with the Earth. So we could do exactly that if there is one. Sounds science fiction, but it's, people are spending money on it, right? It's a real concern. So I think in order to, the way to think about this decision is not as a scientist, because it's a, it's a much more deep decision than that. And I think you need to put yourself in the position of maybe one of the few survivors 
You were the politician who said yes, no, and you said no. And then you put yourself in the position, if you were lucky enough to be the, among the few survivors who are gradually descending back into the Stone Age, and people come up to you and you say, why didn't you choose to spend the money? And you say, well, you know, we took a scientific approach to the problem, and we decided that there wasn't a one in 20 chance that you know, there was a relation, and, and I'm sorry, we, we just didn't spend the money. I think that's unacceptable. I don't think you can use that kind of reasoning. And I think that's the position our politicians are in in climate change. There are some scientists who are saying it's not happening. Okay. I think we need to act. So yes, we should act. That's my answer. So let's turn a bit to one of the other things that you often hear. People will say, oh, New Zealand's such a small country. And it's, to me, it's one of the greatest countries, even with a funny accent. It's a great country. But does it really matter what we do? The point is that every single person on Earth can say that. You could get the inhabitants of Maine, population one million, saying, we're part of a big country, but Maine's such a small part of that big country, it doesn't really matter what we do. You know, so this is, a, this is a collective problem. We all need to act. We all need to encourage each other to act. We all need to participate. So here is New Zealand's contribution to the problem. We're the green bit there, along with chucked in with Australia and Japan, and USA and Canada, the big blue bit. And you can see that as you move out of the rich countries, you get into much bigger populations, but much, much lower impacts. And that has some political consequences that we're going to talk about a bit later. These are our greenhouse gas emissions, our best estimates of them. As since 1990. The red is the, the total. And if we look at the estimates, the projections for 2012, we're going to emit 77 million tons of CO2 equivalent. And uh, almost half that will come from, ag from agriculture. Um, of most of the rest will come from energy. But industrial processes contribute. So does waste. And so does a little bit of deforestation. Still going on just to a small degree. So that's the shape of our problem. And the interesting thing about the shape of our problem is that it's quite different from most other developed countries. Because agriculture is such a huge part of it. And that's very strange for what is normally considered to be a first world country. Now it's interesting, our first world country is, really has a, th a third world kind of structure. It's just that we were essentially part of Britain until 1968. So we managed to climb our way into the first world. Right? 68 was when Britain joined the EEC. And then we shut out our exports. 95% of our exports went to Britain. We were just more or less part of an industrial country at that time from an, a, an economic point of view. So we have this very interesting profile. Now, most of what agriculture does, and another argument you'll hear is agriculture is carbon neutral. Have you heard that? Agriculture is carbon neutral because you know the cows eat the grass and then they belch, and it's just you know carbon in, carbon out. What's the problem? The trouble is the carbon that's taken in by the grass is CO2, and what's belched is methane. And methane's some 22 times worse as a greenhouse gas than carbon. So it's the conversion of CO2 to methane, which is the problem. And uh, that's why we talk about CO2 equivalents rather than just CO2. So should we become a greenhouse gas neutral country. In my view, we could do it easily and relatively inexpensively. I think I heard lately that there's more than $100 million being borrowed by our government each month. Each, is, have you heard that? Yeah, OK. So let's think of that kind of scale and borrowing per month when we think about becoming greenhouse gas neutral. It would make a positive contribution to the environment. And that's its most telling benefit. But it would also set an international example. We would be the first country, I believe, certainly the first developed country to be greenhouse gas neutral. Imagine what impact that would make, an impact out of all proportion to our size. It would enhance our reputation. It would facilitate our exports. Imagine you're going, you're going to the European Union trying to push the boundaries on getting milk powder in, and you're able to say, we're greenhouse gas neutral. Imagine what that would do. It would increase tourism. 
The question is how? Now, there are many ways that people can have an impact on climate change. And these are common ones. Wind energy, biofuels, solar energy. And to some extent, I'm sure they have a part to play. We can change the way we live. It takes time. We can, a lot of us would be using more efficient light bulbs these days. We might think of solar power stations. That's in the top middle there. We might think of energy efficient houses that really don't need any heating, like those in the top right. We might think of buses that use biofuels, changing the structure of our communities to cycle more, using solar energy to heat our water. They're all good ways to reduce our energy consumption or to find new ways of getting energy and re reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. Does anybody know what this is? Who can tell me what this is? This is another part of the audience participation. It is. It's called a tokamak. And this is the one, this is one that's being built now. It's uh, being built by an organization called ITER, a consortium of countries. They're building it in France. And they believe, based on their analysis of the some 200 other fusion reactors that have been built in miniature around the world over the past few decades, they believe that the energy output from this will be some 10 times the energy input. And that will be a watershed for us if it happens. It'll come online sometime around 2020. It's been under construction for quite a while. And then the plan is to make a bigger one. And that one will come online probably some 20 to 30 years later. And the question is, I think, personally, I think fusion power has got to be an important energy source for the future. It's got to be something that could save us. But it's a long way away. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, we could make some savings. We could try a few alternative ways of getting energy. We've been trying to do that for the last few decades with very modest success. Well, this leads me to a story I love to tell, and some of you will have heard this from me before. But um, this is a story about a few scientists who lived many years ago who I really admire. Now, in these days, people didn't know anything about photosynthesis. They didn't understand how plants grew. And uh, Johann Baptist von Helmont in 1648, he was in an environment where people believed that biomass came from the soil. And um, he put a 2.3 kilogram willow and he planted it into 90.9 kilograms of soil. And he waited five years. And then he weighed the soil again and he weighed the plant and he scratched his head. He thought, oh. We're not right about biomass coming from the soil. <laughs> and then there's Joseph Priestley. And as I said to some of my colleagues a couple of days ago, you wouldn't get this one past the Ethics Committee today. But if you put a mouse in a bell jar, eventually the poor little thing asphyxiates. And uh, he discovered that if you put the plant in with the mouse, it took a little bit longer for this mouse to asphyxiate. And uh, Jan Ingenhaus showed that when the mouse died when the plant was deprived of light, but he lived if the plant was in sunlight. So something about the plant is doing something to the atmosphere. They're just getting the glimmer of what was going on, right, with, with, with photosynthesis. By this time, poor old mouse was really fed up with being sort of regenerated and asphyxiated. But, you know, Jocelyn Abbe pointed out that plants contain carbon in proportion to their biomass. In the case of trees, it's roughly half. So we know that carbon dioxide is taken up by plants routinely. And as we increase the amount of biomass in the landscape, we increase the carbon storage in the landscape. We can see this. Remember those wiggles in the record from Mauna Loa? If we look at that across different latitudes, we can see that in the northern hemisphere, there's a really big amplitude. And there's a smaller amplitude in the southern hemisphere, where there's less land and fewer plants. And that the amplitude in the southern hemisphere is the reverse. When it's down in the north, it's up in the south. Okay? Those are plants breathing in and out, breathing carbon dioxide in and out with the seasons. If we look at the relative amounts of carbon in the atmosphere, 
and in organic stuff in the biosphere. The, the amount in organic stuff vastly exceeds what's in the atmosphere. Now, there's been an enormous amount of change in the amount of biomass that human, human beings have, been, have allowed to relain, re, remain on the, on the landscape. Vast areas have been deforested and reduced to lower biomass systems. And in New Zealand, we had 80% forests. We're down to about 27% or so, between 27 and 30, depending on what you count. Um, so forests are carbon reservoirs. And if we take a piece of grassland, we take a piece of eroded grassland, and we put it into trees, those trees that become a carbon store, they are become sinks, those new forests. Now, one of my colleagues in the U.S. says they're leaky sinks. Well, they are, because at some point, the forest will become just a reservoir, and as it starts to degrade, it may lose some carbon back into the atmosphere. So that's true, too. The IPCC says the global mitigation potential from forests would be that if we started planting now, we'd 3.8 petagrams by 2030. And if we look at what's happening in New Zealand, these are the greenhouse gas removals from New Zealand forestry. Remember, we, we have an, a, a gross output of greenhouse gases of around 77 million tons per annum. And our trees are removing about 25 million, given the forest we currently have. There's a lot of new forests that we currently have. That's, that's, there's a sinks. Now, we're well aware of this in the forestry sector. We've done a lot of modeling, a lot of research on it. And we know that if we take a system where we're harvesting periodically, and this is radiated pine in this case, that there's a lot of carbon. And to get CO2 equivalent, you have to multiply uh, by, let me see, carbon's 12 mostly. And it's CO2 is, uh, so it's going to be 16 and times 2 and 12. So what is it? 42? Is that right? 44. Uh, 44 divided by 12, multiply the, this and you get the amount of CO2 equivalent. And um, we can see that if we plant a new forest and then we harvest it, on average we increase the carbon store in the landscape. There's some other issues we need to deal with when we're talking about climate change and forestry. This is an area of kangaroo forest that was deforested and put into dairy farm. And uh, notice the difference in color between the grass and the, the neighboring forests. Um, now, the forest is much darker. And that has an effect on the albedo, the reflectance of when you get. So green, the way a greenhouse works is you have short wave coming in. Some of it's reflected straight back out through the outer space. Some of it's absorbed. And what's absorbed, again, gets re-radiated re at very long waves. Um, and those are the, the waves that are kept in by greenhouse gases. So there's an issue here that we need to address. So grass albedo is about maybe 0.18, typically in New Zealand. Some would say a little bit higher than that. Radiata pine albedo is 0.12. So there's potential for landscape with forests to absorb more shortwave radiation and emit it as long wave which means that plantation establishment could raise local temperatures. Now, are we concerned about greenhouse gases, or are we concerned about temperature, changes in temperature? We can, I would say we're concerned with changes in temperature. So this led to an article that's now famous by Bale et al. in 2007. And they were saying, based on some very, very broad brush global modeling, that forests are not really beneficial for climate change in temperate and boreal latitudes only in the tropics that you could really make a case to say they were beneficial from the point of view of climate change. In 2011, Pongratz et al. did a much more fine analysis of where the forests were likely to go and in, in temperate zones. And they pointed out that past deforestation was mostly on very productive land. So there's a lot of carbon sequestration, much higher than had been assumed by Bale et al. And uh, that those lands had less snow. And a big part of the Bale analysis involves snow. Well, there's been a local analysis, um, and it's thought that we get a somewhere around a 10 to 20 percent reduction in the afforestation benefit from albedo in New Zealand if we're afforesting a, a pr really productive species. That happened in 2003. 
Another benefit of forests is that wood is more climate friendly than other construction materials, and we can't rule that out as a benefit. So air-dried wood has an embodied energy footprint of 0.5 megajoules per kilogram, 34 megajoules per kilogram for steel. So remember that guy on television who comes up and says how steel framing of your house is so much more environmentally friendly? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. 90 megajoules per kilogram for plastics and 170 megajoules per kilogram for aluminum. Concrete, concrete manufacture produces CO2. So given that much of our marginal energy comes from fossil fuels, wood construction is potentially more climate friendly. And if the wood is built well, if the house is designed well, it's, uh, it can be more climate friendly in, in total than other kinds of manufacturing. So one of my colleagues, Justin Ford Robertson, has tried to assemble the sorts of contributions that uh, a forest might make to uh, mitigating climate change. So to begin with, you have the forest acting as a sink. And if it's being harvested periodically, it gets to more or less a steady state. And that's what happens in the blue line. You have some maybe more products built out of wood, some houses replaced that are that are built into wood, so those products become part of our wood infrastructure in the in the uh, in our communities, and that's a benefit because the wood is stored in those products. You get some avoided emissions from using wood instead of aluminium and steel and those other things, and you have the potential for using wood as energy. So there's an ongoing benefit from establishing of the forest. Now, this is what we've been doing for forest establishment in New Zealand. And this is an important thing to address. And it has co political consequences. It has climate consequences. Uh, we've had three what we call planting booms of new forest. The first one happened when some very smart people got together and they realized that New Zealand was going to run out of wood if it kept relying on native forests for its wood supply. And uh, they began a plantation process, a plantation establishment process, to address that problem. And uh, they had the benefits of unemployed people to uh, employ, to plant the forest, but they didn't actually create the forest to soak up unemployment. That's a myth. They planted the forest because they could see New Zealand was going to run out of wood. And they gave us a domestic wood supply in, in our plantations. And they took the heat off our native forests. The second boom was also in, inspired by the state. And uh, these are both state interventions in the economy, which anybody here from Treasury? because I know that I'll get shot saying that, but they were state inter interventions in the, in the economy, and they worked. They gave us our forestry sector. And uh, the second one was uh, both public and private forests being planted, but with large subsidies from the pu public sector. The third one is interesting, because you know what happened in 1986? What happened in 1986? What happened during the 1980s? Roger Douglas. Well done, sir. Roger Douglas happened in the, in the 1980s. And uh, as a consequence of Roger Douglas, we didn't have a means to intervene any longer in, the, in our economy in forestry. We lost that tool. We'd love to have it now that we're confronted with this climate change issue. But we had a boom in planting that was entirely from the private sector. And that was an interesting phenomenon. There are a lot of people who have very, we, we argue about why it happened. I, I go with Piers McLaren, I, his, his view is that um, it's people looking for retirement options because their retirement options have been taken away by, by Roger. Anyway, the, that boom ceased around the year, or just after the year 2000, as you can see. Now, these, these have consequences, these, these booms. And these are the immediate consequences of that boom in the 1990s. If we look at our gross emissions and we look at our net emissions, we've got a period that we're in right now when those new forests are sequestering a lot of carbon. And so our net emissions are a lot less than our gross emissions. But look what's projected to happen in the 2020s. Those are all those 1990 forests being harvested. We've got a real problem if we still have Kyoto commitments or Kyoto-like commitments, if we, if we still have commitments to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the 2020s. Because if the harvest goes ahead as scheduled, then we've got to find some other way of filling that gap our net emissions will be much, much greater than our gross emissions. And the government is well aware of that. They're not silly. You don't believe me, do you? They're not silly. 
So how do forestry solutions differ from those other solutions that we looked at before? The other solutions were about finding new energy sources and reducing our, or reducing our energy consumption. Those are the two alternatives. The way forestry solutions differ is that we actually take carbon out of the atmosphere if we plant trees on grassland. We take it out. We reduce yesterday's emissions. We can use it to offset other emissions and give us time to make those changes, to change the way we live. Because ultimately, we have to change the way we live in order to solve this problem. But forestry can give us a lead time, a bigger lead time, to make those drastic changes. Now, it's temporary. New forests begin as sinks. And the question is, how temporary? And to some extent, it depends on what species you plant. But one of my very clever colleagues, Richard Woolens, has done, recently published a paper looking at just a very few what we call permanent sample plots. These are plots that we put out in our forests, and we measure them periodically to figure out how the trees are growing. And we make models from those measurements as well. And we hardly ever get many plots much past the age 30 in uh, radiated pine because we always cut down the trees before we can go further. But there are a few plots which have gone a long way in time, and one of them out to 100. And the interesting thing about the instant analysis, by the way, this bit here is all thinning. Okay, it's all a lot of extraction thinning happening in here uh, for the forests and the audience. The interesting thing is, out to 100 years, we're still, we're still gathering carbon with those forests, which is really, really interesting. Now, you could say there's a bit of self-selection going on here that these are on sites where the trees would continue to do that. And of course, there aren't any plots from where trees wouldn't continue to do that because trees weren't there to do it. Right? Well, that's true. But I would guess we could get 60 years of really solid sequestration on most sites in New Zealand based on this sample. And it does vary with species. Here you see a, a range of projections from Peter Beats at Scion. Um, Radiata pine pruned is the, the red. Radiata pine uh, unpruned is the yellow. Um, and this is on an average site. Of course, it's going to vary with site quality. Um, Totoro and Kauri are down the bottom. So while I would love to think that they're the solution, and I'd love to see us plant them across the landscape, um, they are unlikely to, be, to feature uh, if people are doing this for financial reasons. Um, and in some cases, they will be. We have here also Douglas fir, uh, cypress, redwood, and Eucalyptus fastigata, which grows at similar rates in volume to radiata pine when it's young, but it has a higher density, so it sequesters more carbon. So what might forestry contribute, or what could forestry contribute? Well, if we really want to try and solve the whole problem with forestry, and we probably don't, but if we did, we could. That's the first message. New Zealand's total emissions are 77 kilo, uh, should say a million tons. I'm sorry, there's a, a mistake in my overhead there, of CO2 equivalent per annum. I had it written out as 77,000 and then forgot to change the K to the M. If we established 150,000 hectares per annum between 2013 and 2020, at the end of that period of time, in seven years' time, we would be sequestering roughly half of our emissions through those forests. If we continue to do that up to 2030, we would be sequestering more than our net, our, our total gross emissions, 81 million tons of CO2 equivalent per annum, roughly. Roughly, with hectare radiated pine, we'll sequester around 30 tons per hectare per annum. Some, on some sites will be more, some sites will be less, some ages more, some ages less. But that's a, a useful number to have in the back of your head if you're a forester. The cost might be something like what we borrow in a couple of weeks at the moment in our government per annum. And by 2020, assuming $20 per ton, and I know that's not the current price, we'll get to that, the credits from those forests would be worth about $720 million per annum. It was $8 per, per ton. Of course, it would be considerably less, but still, that would be more than, it would be about $270 million per annum. Um, 
If we didn't harvest the forests, what would happen? Well, it's a little known fact that in anything other than extreme sites, when we plant our hectares of radiated pine, as the forests get older, we get a native forest coming up underneath. We get a population of native plants in warm, wet environments. And we, then we go in, usually about age 27 to 30, somewhere around there, we knock the trees over, and it all starts again. We get exotic plants in with the trees to begin with, and then we get increasingly native plants growing up. So each cycle, we get the cycle of exotic to native, exotic to native. And um, this is some work, some projections made by Hawley in 2001. What might happen at a site close to here if we were to plant Pinus radiata and just walk away? And their guess is that after about 200 years, we'd have a native forest. So if we were on sites where we were sequestering carbon and maybe the landowner didn't want to or it wasn't worth it to go in and harvest, because there are sites like that where it's too inaccessible to go in and harvest, we could get, solve the problem very quickly with radiated pine and very easily and then wait and the, we'd eventually have native forest on many of those sites. And I personally find that kind of heartwarming. <laughs> so where might we plant? And where we might plant and where it makes sense to plant um, from an environmental point of view are actually quite inaccessible areas quite often. Of New Zealand's total area, just under 27 million hectares, we have 1.1 million hectares of erosion-prone land under grass. And you've probably seen some of it. We have 30, uh, officially 3.6 million hectares of what's called marginal land that's not much good for anything, they say, but trees will actually grow in it quite well in most cases. We have three to four million hectares of severely eroded land according to reasonably reliable reports. That's what it looks like. I was flying on an aircraft between Christchurch and Rotorua back in the 1970s and I was reading one of those reports and it said that out of New Zealand's 27 million hectares, we had up as much as 8 to 10 million hectares that periodically eroded. And I thought, wow, that's huge. How come I never see it? And I looked down through the aircraft, through a, through a, crowd, a, a little gap in the cloud, and I saw this. And I thought, oh, that's a bit of coincidence. I was just reading about erosion, and I went and saw some. And I drove down through the king country a few weeks later, and this was everywhere. It would have been a huge coincidence if I didn't see it. Now, what does this cost us? Well, it certainly costs hill country farmers who, by the way, make pretty much a zero return at the moment. It certainly costs them some production. And they keep on reestablishing grass and trying to farm it. But it costs us more than that. Do you remember a few years ago, we had a lot of flooding down in the Wairarapa and a lot of siltation? And we taxpayers helped those farmers out to the tune of about 280 million to clean up the mess. The solution to that is trees in the hills. If you had trees in the hills, we wouldn't have had to spend that 280 million. How can we bring this about? Well, you've all heard of the Kyoto Protocol. Who's not heard of the Kyoto Protocol? Everybody has heard of the Kyoto Protocol. So I can go quickly through this. It's an agreement between governments, and that makes it difficult. <laughs> It sets up international emissions trading. It's an attempt to solve the problem, and that's really positive. That's the most positive thing about it, probably, is that it's governments have got together and said, we have a problem. Let's at least try and do something, which is fantastic. And it divides countries into Annex I countries and non-Annex I countries. Annex I countries are people like us who are fairly wealthy and first world. And we can buy and sell credits. Developing nations can sell. They're not required to buy credits for reasons, remember that graph of population versus impact? Problem is mostly in the first world. But there's argument about that. New Zealand's target, the target we chose for ourselves, is to reduce our net emissions of greenhouse gases to 1990 levels between 2008 to 2012. And we're at the end of that first, what's called the first commitment period this year. Now remember, 50% of our emissions come from agriculture, roughly, a bit less than 50%. The initial very optimistic calculations that led to us agreeing to that commitment were that we'd have no population, they were based on an assumption of no population increase from the 1990s 
uh, and 40,000 hectares of new forest per annum. And unfortunately, both those were wrong. And uh, there was a lot of concern in Wellington that we were going to end up having to buy lots of credits from people overseas because we would not meet our target. The reality is we got an almost 30% rise in population. Uh, the net plantation area slightly reduced as a lot of deforestation went on in some areas in order to convert it to dairy land. Um, and we were thinking that we would have a bill of maybe a billion dollars or so in 2012. Now we're reported to be more than meeting our targets. And by the way, this, is, this was agreed in 1997. Um, and you can trade what are called AAUs. They're the International Trading Currency in Carbon Credits, assigned amount units. New York community, they agreed to go 8% below 1990 levels. In New Zealand, we said zero. The Australians said plus eight, and then they backed out, and now they just come back in. Um, the USA said minus seven, and it's never ratified that agreement. Um, on average, all Annex I countries said they were going to have a 5% reduction. And uh, most of them, with the exception of Canada, which is just pulled out rather than pay, um, are meeting their commitments. This is the most up-to-date estimate of where we're going to be at the end of 2012. Um, this is from the Ministry for the Environment, the 2012 publication. And there's our AAU allocation. That takes us up to our 1990 levels over that period of years. Um, and what has saved us are removals from those 1990 forests. So when you see somebody who owns one of those 1990 forests, you should go and shake their hand and say, thank you, sir. There's one sitting in the audience right there. 40 hectares, is it? I'm Banksman next to you. 250. There you are. <laughs> thank you, sir. Well done. I appreciate it. On my behalf, you give me a free gift of sequestration, and I'm really grateful. <laughs> and we're going to have a slight surplus. These are our latest figures. And it's because of those forests, that forest planting. So how do you translate? This is the problem that the National Party was coping, groping with and the Labor Party before them. How do you translate international agreements into changes in behavior between you and I and between people on the ground? Because it's not easy. You could become a totalitarian state. And even then, it's not easy because people revolt. You know. And in our kind of democracy, it's hard. So they settled on, they tried a few things. They, they thought about a carbon tax, and then somebody drove a tractor up the, up the, the steps of parliament. And they said, oh, but not do that. They want tractors in parliament. And uh, so they settled on this emissions trading scheme. And uh, this establishes an internal currency in carbon trading called a New Zealand unit. And it's exactly the same size as an AAU. It just has a different name. And you have to convert your NZUs to AUs if you want to trade internationally. But it's one ton of CO2 equivalent. And the original scheme had a staged entry that looked something like this, that forestry would come in in 2008. And uh, then in 2010, you'd have stationary energy and industrial processes. In 2011, liquid fuels. And in 2013, agriculture would come in. And they were not, didn't all have the same level of obligation. So sectors were sort of divided up according to their level of obligation. Foresters were able to sequester carbon, so they were in, you might think, a happy position. But there were large numbers of them that planted their forests before 1990 who weren't allowed to sell credits. But if they changed their forest use, would have to start buying credits. And they were worried. But um, to the, the National Party changed the scheme somewhat. Oh, by the way, I should say the, uh, these, these guys here would initially start with 50% free allocation, and then that would be removed. These guys here would get over 90% of a free allocation of NZUs, and they would go down by a small percentage each year. And uh, the, the National Party changed the rules, pulled these two together, and they came in, in the middle of 2010, and then put agriculture out to 2015, um, and gave them 90% 90, uh, 90 free allocation and an even smaller gradient. So by 2050, they'd still only have a 50% obligation to surrender credits for their emissions. You can see that this is really, really political stuff. And the scheme, with the, the idea behind the scheme 
the original idea behind carbon trading is that if somebody puts carbon into the atmosphere, then you should be able to establish some kind of a, a, a least cost mechanism for taking it out again. So that if you buy a carbon credit, then you should be buying a credit that represents that carbon taken out of the atmosphere at least cost. And so you can claim greenhouse gas neutrality if you're buying credits for the full amount of your emissions. That's the original idea. Even our original scheme went away from that, and it's caused problems ever since that moving away. You note this free credits that get used here by the, that give, give to this industrial firm, if they reduce their emissions, they can actually sell those credits, right? Um, and there are further extensions beyond that that we'll talk about in a minute. Potential forestry impacts if we had a reasonably healthy price for credits, which we don't at the moment, but more new forest, particularly on marginal eroding farmland, we would hope. Longer rotations, better wood quality, larger piece sizes, which is all music to the ears of harvesters and sawmillers. Higher stockings, and very likely forests that would never be harvested and would probably revert to native forest eventually, which should be music to the ears of those who love native forests. If we were to say that all the demand was gonna be met by, by foresters, by people growing forests, then you put that original scheme whether well, this is a revised scheme, there's two, the agriculture coming in in 2015, um, it looks like quite a large demand through time. But it's not working. This is the current New Zealand unit price, NZU price. Uh, this is what it's looked like since uh, 2009 when it was up around $20. Uh, it's now down at around 7 and it's been as low as six. And I can tell you, people in the forestry sector are looking at that and saying, big deal. So there's a problem. And I call it the CER problem. It's one of the problems. We'll deal with another couple in a minute. Emitters of greenhouse gases should purchase credits from greenhouse gas sequesters in proportion to their emissions. That way, the market will find the cheapest way to deal with their pollution. That's the original conception of carbon trading. You'll find it written down. When they offset their emissions with credits, they can be said to be greenhouse gas neutral. And that can be a proud thing that a factory can put on their big gate and a big sign and hopefully collect more customers and have people feel good about their company and also do something positive for the environment. The reality is, emitters of greenhouse gases who reduce their emissions get what's called a certified emission reduction credit. When they offset their emission, their remaining emissions with credits, they think they can be said to be greenhouse gas neutral. So let's, they're kidding themselves. They, this is basic high school mathematics, right? It doesn't work that way. You have this, this is a mythical company taken from Microsoft uh, photo inventory. Um, but 2015, let's say it's, it's putting out 100,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. And it needs to surrender 100,000 credits to be greenhouse gas neutral. And then it finds a way to reduce its emissions by half. And it puts out 50,000 tons of CO2 equivalent and it now has to surrender 50,000 credits. But hey, it's just been given 50,000 CERs. So it surrenders those to cover its remaining emissions, and it puts a big sign on its gate. <laughs> it's getting a double whammy. The reward for reducing emissions should be you don't have to buy any more of those 50,000 credits. You shouldn't get an additional 50,000. But the fact is, our country is being flooded with CER, countries, CER credits right now, they're cheap, they're dirt cheap, as you might imagine. It's really easy to do this. And the response is that our mar we got market failure in our emissions trading scheme. And unfortunately, we heard just a couple of days ago that there's not going to be, there was, there was a recommendation for a restriction on imports of CER credits, and there's going to be no restriction on CER credits, according to our minister. Very sad day. There's a sector problem. 
In 2008, forestry was fully in. In 2012, energy and liquid fuels were required to have 50% of surrender. And in 2015, they're supposed to go up to 100% surrender requirement. And the government is really worried about the impact on your pocketbook of that change. And it's very convenient to have low priced credits, in my opinion. We now have no date when agriculture is going to come in, and it's going to only require 10% surrender. And the interesting thing here is foresters and agriculturalists, they actually use the same basic resource, the land. And uh, so it makes agriculture considerably more profitable to not have to surrender credits. And the, uh, it, it creates an imbalance in the marketplace. It may not be a huge issue, but it has, a, it has, a, it has an impact. Uh, but there's a more subtle, a more subtle impact, and that is, it's probably embodied by this little story. When I was a young man, many, many, many years ago, I was a young man. You may not believe it, but I was. And um, I became a forester, and my, I was, I'm a New Zealander, and my Uncle George had a farm in the Waikato. And uh, he had a dairy farm, and he'd been given that farm by the government when he came back from the Second World War, and it was covered in native forest when he got the farm. It was 240 acres, and uh, he, so about 100 hectares, and he, he um, he felled it with his own hands, and he converted that farm into grass. And it would have been, I would imagine, mixed podocarp hardwood. You know, and you kind of weep when you think about what the forest probably was. But anyway, when I became a for forester, he was afraid of me. <laughs> he was right next to Kinleith across the river, and something, as he got older, he loved his land, and he loved his operation. He loved his cows, and he was a really great farm and a really good guy. But he, he sort of saw these trees across the river. And I think when, he, when I became a forester, he had this vision of me grabbing a, a box full of trees and planting up his farm. And he, it, it upset him. And it got a bit embarrassing at times. He would, one time, he, he was, as you get older, as I'm, I'm probably demonstrating myself, you know, your, your brain doesn't work quite as rapidly sometimes as you would like. And um, I said something innocuous at the table one, one Christmas. And he said, you want to buy my farm? No, I didn't say anything about buying a farm. Well, this embodies a, an attitude. And there's a social problem that prevents us from, from creating some envi environmental benefits. That's part of, of this, this issue here, the sector problem. Social problem is that there's a term that you probably all heard. It's called breaking in the land. You heard that term? OK, well, breaking in the land means getting rid of the trees, putting into something profitable like grass, and becoming a wealthy farmer. And that's what he'd done. That kind of ethic is still infused throughout our rural landscape. And those kinds of attitudes are still throughout our rural communities, with a few very, very welcome exceptions. People in rural areas are not comfortable with trees, especially in Canterbury at the moment. Now, there are some who are comfortable with trees. And I'd like to end on a positive note. So this is. But that, I, what I wanted to say was that we have a social problem as well as a market failure. We have federated farmers saying, not only do they think the ETS is crazy, but they don't believe in climate change. When in fact, if they just turn around and see that the glass is half full, they're the biggest beneficiaries of the ETS. All they have to do is take their worst land and put it in trees, and they're wealthy. Massively wealthy, as shown by one of my friends, Nick Seymour, who has 1,000 hectares of Hill Country Farm north of Gisborne. And this is part of it. And what you can see in that picture is part of 140 hectares of trees that he put in virtually free because the, there's a lot of erosion north of Gisborne. And the Gisborne District Council really wants to get rid of it. And they really want to encourage tree planting. And he planted 140 hectares. He sorted out his roading so that he can harvest it easily without great expense through his neighbor's property. His neighbor had a road going to this block. And when he harvests this in about 12 years' time, he's going to get the equivalent of winning the Golden Kiwi from a hill country farm. So there's, an, there's a social problem that, that hawks, that's caused by our history. 
a misunderstanding of the nature of what forestry can be in the rural communities of our country. And that's part of the reason we're not achieving what we could achieve to mitigate climate change with forestry. So a quick summary of my main points. Firstly, climate change is predi predicted from the influence of greenhouse gases and largely the impacts are expected to be negative on people and on other kinds of living things. And the Kyoto Protocol establishes an international carbon trading. New Zealand issues are a commitment to the 1990 net emissions, decreasing forest area, increasing population and fossil fuel use, and 50% of our emissions are from agriculture where people are very, very antagonistic. Uh, in fact, I heard a story that one of the Horizons staff was chased out of a catchment when he suggested planting trees in that district. Forests can be greenhouse gas sources, sinks, or reservoirs, but new forests can buy us time while we reduce energy consumption or change our energy sources. And there, is, there are positive things on the horizon. It's just the horizon is quite a long way away. But there are positive means by which we can reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. New Zealand's emission trading scheme is an attempt to translate our international commitments into day-to-day -day transactions. And it has a few issues. And CERs are undermining the prices of NZUs. And treating sectors differently creates inequities. And on top of that, we have the social issue that we need to work on. It's a communication issue, but it's more than that. It's, a, it's an ingrained set of values that we need to work on. So we, the last message is, though, that we could be, if we wanted to be, if we wanted to make a relatively modest investment, we could be the first nation on Earth to be fully greenhouse gas neutral. And I think that would be uh, an absolutely magnificent thing. 